Thank you to the source of creation for everything, for this live healing webinar, for the entire webinar healing collective, for all the work we've done together and all the work that we shall do together coming forward, the divinity within all of us, blessing our session to work concisely and efficiently and profoundly. We want to give a big shout out, a big wave of gratitude to the ancestors for their role in the manifestation of our physiologies. To the eternal tradition of wisdom for acting as a bridge between individuality and eternal being. Mm -hmm. For also anchoring the flow of wisdom, the flow of knowingness from the absolute to the relative. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with me tonight and for all of us being together. So grateful. Okay, energy healing is the process of focusing attention concisely in order to produce a specific effect on the environment. First, we want to go down into the source or the seed of the imbalance and focus attention there. And that's what this healing webinar is all about, right? Because the seeds of karma are kind of at the source of the um, imbalances, symptoms, problems that crop up at the surface. So that's the idea. We want to cut to the chase. We want to get down into the core of the concern and put our attention there in the most intelligent way in order to create an effect that's going to eliminate pressures on the surface, that's going to uplift the quality of life and success in all areas at the material level of creation. Okay. So... Uprooting the seeds of karma. I know pretty much everybody in this group has a pretty fairly clear idea of what karma is. I think mostly everybody. But I need to define just a few characteristics of karma in order to help lay out the um, landscape of the seeds of karma so that we know how to focus our attention in the most concise and intelligent manner. Okay, so karma can be, in a word, described as action. Essentially, every action, every thought, every word we speak emanates from our being, and it goes out and it touches whatever's, whatever's closest, right? It touches the close things in the environment, and then it reflects back, and then it continues moving out into the larger environment, and then reflects back from there, and so forth. Particularly, uh, we know that sound waves propagate ad infinitum. And the finer and more abstract waves of action are, the more effortlessly they propagate through the creation. And this is important because there's an um, old saying that for the intellect, for the human intellect, karma is unfathomable. Um, I believe the source of that comes from the reality that the human thought process, the human mind, can only entertain one thought at a time. So due to the ability to only be able to think one thought at a time, it may actually be impossible for us as humans to completely understand karma. But that's okay. That doesn't have to stop us <laughs> from trying. We still have to try. And the reason is that our reality is formed in such a way that if we don't understand karma, if we can't deal with karma, then we're in trouble. So <laughs> we sort of are in a paradox, a bit of a dilemma here, that because of the human mind's inability to think more than one thought at a time, even if we can think quickly, you know, but it's still one at a time. Um, we can't fully understand karma, and yet we have to understand karma in order to raise ourselves out of suffering. So we just have to keep trying. And so that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing tonight. We're going to dive in in a deeper than usual, deeper than usual way into the whole field of karma. and 
understanding it, I've got a model for you, for everybody tonight to look at, um, then it should allow us to get our attention in, even if we can't fully completely understand every last little detailed ramification of karma. It should still allow us to use our attention to affect the karma, which is causing problems, and then eliminate it. So that's the bad karma, to eliminate. Oh, and also um, another word about it is there are, there are three types, according to Vedic uh, understanding, Vedic science, three types of karma. There's good karma, bad karma, and neutral karma. So different types of actions. And there are also, karma is also nested, right? So we can have cellular karma, or you can have whole person karma, or you can have family karma, um, community karmas, religious karma, religions or groups, social groups, world karma, even karma in our solar system, uh, galactic karma, universal karma, different layers like that. All right. So part of the trick is determining based on the symptom at the surface, what's the, where the seed of that is. So I'm thinking, I wanted to do a lot of healing for everyone tonight. That's the idea. And a lot of the questions that came in are, um, describe serious concerns that people have. So I think it's important that we have the, that we focus in on these concerns and really make everything practical. So the first thing we want to do is support everyone's ability to connect from the symptom, whatever the symptom is on the surface, to determine what is that, what type of karma are we looking at? Now, of course, if the symptom is uncomfortable, we don't have to guess. We're probably looking at negative karma. But um, the interesting thing about this is that I want to go into the healing, but I have to say something else first. Okay, and that is that the past is a lesser state of evolution. So at every moment, if we're producing impulses of our intelligence and our action that are going out into the relative, when they, these actions start reflecting back to us from locations in the relative, always they will reflect back a lesser state of self. They will reflect back, thank you. They will reflect back... <laughs> something that we were, not what we are now. So what it means is, in the present moment, we're always looking at karmic, um, karmic impulses, which are not reflective of our full potential in this moment, or certainly not our full potential in the future. I think this is very important. I'm looking at it. It's important to understand because this is one of the first things that trips up the ancestors. So it looks like we are going into a bit of a healing here. There are beliefs which are clearing. Looks like they're clearing from the Ajna chakra, the throat chakra, and the heart chakra areas. And whenever we get into the heart chakra, it seems like it always wants to spread out and take up the whole heart maha marma. So we could probably say head and chest, but, but I'm actually seeing it isolated in the cord of light, which is kind of running and connecting those parts. And that is a belief. It's clearing. It's a belief that's clearing that what I'm having to face I'm, is because this is not only who I am now, but who I will be in the future. It's like a prediction of trouble to come. And so um, this karma is this thread, these beliefs, the beliefs are like a thread. I'd like to say also, this is very important for today's navigation through the uh, constructs of karma, is that anytime we do or say anything or think anything, that impulse of expression essentially takes a form like a thread. It opens up out into the creation, it spirals out into the creation like that. It's important to know that we're basically dealing with threads. 
karma in its most essential form is particularly very difficult karmas, very heavy karmas, are usually conglomerations of threads, like knots. Sometimes I refer to them as karmic knots. And the threads can contain, they can have as their, um, their foundation or their seed, can be like a belief, can be behind that thread. Like if there's that belief that whatever I'm facing at any given moment is a reflection of not only who I am now, but is indicating what is going to have terrible things that are going to happen in the future, then that belief is, acts like a magnet, right? It's like a kind of a thread in itself. It's coming down to us through the ancestral lines and it acts like a magnet that catches up other threads around it and can start to create knots of discord. So that's clearing those beliefs or clearing from this heart center and up into the court of light. I would say that all the threads are actually sacred. They're all forms of life. They're all, well, they're all consciousness. And they actually, even though they function according to laws of nature, as do we, they're, they're also much less constrained by the relative field of creation than we are in our physical forms. And they have a sentience about them. Look, they last for so long, right? They're ancient. If I say, hey, <laughs> the hey goes out into creation and it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. So like millions of years from now, my hey is going to be out there bouncing off of stars and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, it's a thing. It's like older than I am. It's, I, I produced it, produced from this physiology but it has life force in it, has being in it. And as it expands and bounces off of all the forms in creation, it grows, becomes an integral part of the web of creation. And the whole web of creation, the whole web of life is alive. So we can think of ourselves as producers or Origin, originators of these threads. All right. Uh, we need to be able to figure out, this is what I wanted to, I was thinking just now, uh, what we need to be able to identify when there's a symptom on the surface. How do we figure out whether the thread, like just a minute ago I said, oh, that's a thread that came from the ancestors. But it's really important for all of us to be able to do that. We need to be able to find the symptom on the surface and then be able to figure out, well, is that from the ancestors or is my own, act, my own behavior somewhere in the past or is it something that's coming from the collective karma or, or what? I'm just um, taking a read on how I do it because for this instrument, it happens very quickly. I would say the reading is done here. This is the center of understanding. So it's not something that takes, it's not um, an intellectual discriminative process that takes place in the brain. And so it's not necessarily done on the foundation of one thought at a time. It's done from the feeling center, from the understanding center of the physiology. And what happens is the symptom, whatever it is, has its uh, gross, we could say most manifest or dense level of expression, and then it has subtler levels of expression, and then at the finest at the causal level, right before the absolute, there's an energy signature. And <clears throat> energy signatures are highly specified. For example, this lovely place, I don't know where this is, it's just a picture that I found, but it's so beautiful, right? This lovely place, it has a feel to it, and the feel to this place is very, very different than the feel to my front porch. It's the, all the, everything has a feel. It has an energy signature. So what we're doing is we're looking for those energy signatures. We follow any 
because it's all at the astral level, everything is threads, everything is streams or filaments of consciousness. You can follow the symptom, which is at the surface, back into the feel of it. And as we go into the field, there's a difference between the feeling of something that is very, very small, like a cell, right? Has a different feel to it than a whole human body, which is actually very small compared to the whole universe, right? And when we think of the cosmos, there's a very distinctive feel to cosmic space, to space, to outer space. It has a feel to it. You know, everybody, <laughs> um, for those of you who remember the days of Star Trek, one of the reasons... <laughs> One of the reasons that TV show was so fascinating was because it, the whole show had as its foundation the feel of space. The feel of space permeated every line of every script and every piece of every set and every costume and so forth. Even if it wasn't 100% accurate, the feeling was right. The feeling was good. It was almost, we could say, download it to Gene Roddenberry. So that's why it was so attractive. And it still is. There's still people that enjoy that show. <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, yeah. So <laughs> I love you guys. So there's a feel. There's a feel that goes along with every experience that's, that comes in through the senses of perception. And the feel has in it a code that associates or connects with very specific energies. And one of them I just talked about from very, very small, like if it's a cellular imbalance up to, you know, say a collective imbalance, a world imbalance. The other forms, such as understanding the beliefs that are behind those, those um, energy signatures, part of it comes from inference. So I do use inference, and I think I've talked about that more in the past. Right now, though, I'm feeling into our collective, and I know that we've got people in the collective that are uncomfortable. We've got people, folks that are feeling uneasy, and so we want to get into really dissolving those seeds of karma. So the reason it can be difficult to pick apart the details of the seed, once we've determined, like, oh, well, this is like personal karma because I had this you know, experience in the past where I wasn't kind or something, or maybe it was a, a war situation, which was horrific, and I was driven to do things that I wouldn't normally do and so forth. Um, once we get into the, the knot of the karma, the first thing that I've started to notice is that the more intense the karma is, the more tightly the threads are bound together. The more tightly you bind anything together, the more orderly it becomes. So the bigger stresses, the bigger karmas are more difficult to pull apart because the threads have become bound together in an orderly fashion and it makes them more stable. The other thing is that in any karmic knot, there can be threads, like there could be a thread from something that you did a million years ago and something that you just did yesterday and something there could be a thread that's coming from a family karma and there could be something that's having to do with solar system karma or something like that so when you get knots like that they can be very complex and it can be difficult to read so what i do is i go in and i pull one thread at a time it's like grabbing the low-hanging fruit right you pull the thread that's the easiest to pull out and move from there. Uh, okay. Okay. Check in my chat box. All right. So, yeah. So, if you can start to unknit, you can start to pick out a single thread, then that will help to loosen 
the tightness of the knot. There's another thing. Every knot of karma originally forms around a single mother thread, a single first thread, you could say, the first thread that comes in. And that's the one that, that acts like a magnet that pulls the other threads in. So normally, if you just have one thread of karma, that usually isn't going to cause a lot of terrible physical symptoms on the surface. Normally, if you're dealing with something horrific, you're probably looking at a knot of karma. The other thing about the knots of karma, so this is just me describing their basic structure, right? The other thing about the knots of karma is once you start getting threads wrapped around each other like that, um, they will tend to attract on the outside something like a shell of discordant feelings. Because when there's a knot that's giving rise to symptoms which are uncomfortable, naturally, and the knot is like kind of almost unfathomable, right? So many different influences of different types. And there can be ho hopelessness is often one of the first discordant feelings that will gather around a knot like that. Hopelessness and then, of course, fear because if something like that is sitting in the physiology, and usually it'll be sitting down at like an astral or even causal level, these knots can sit down at these deep levels. Um, so layers of discordant feelings form around the outside of the knot. And if a, the individual, if we try to get in, what happens is the first thing we have to deal with are the discordant feelings. And they can be like off-putting. They can be off-putting. And so this setup, this arrangement, protects the knot of karma until such time that the energies are sufficiently built up, that the consciousness is sufficiently built up, that it can go in and start extracting those threads. The beauty of our beautiful group is that we have the benefit of all our consciousness together. So if there's a knot that's too much for any one of us to deal with, as a collective, we can do this. And, and we can work on all the knots at the same time. Because as we start working together, as our, co our collective starts functioning in a more and more coherent fashion, there, we can transcend a lot of the boundaries that are naturally found at the denser levels of creation. Like the idea that, well, okay, maybe as a collective, we could work on one knot of stress. No, we can work on all the knots of stress. For example, in fact, we can work better on all of them at once because if there is a mother thread in the center of the knot of karma, then every mother thread will have, maybe, I shouldn't, maybe that's not the best word, the, the, the seed thread, the source of all the threads, the first thread, there's a first thread. All the first threads will have a certain energy signature in common, right? Because being the first one, put it out there, and that somehow it had those specific laws of nature that it attracted other threads around it. So what we need to do is identify the energy signature of the first thread. All right. That shouldn't be too hard, right? Everybody knows what it's like to be first. <laughs> That's easy. First has, its, first has its place, and it's easy to identify. It's a little bit harder to discriminate, like, the 97th from the 98th, like that would be a harder discriminating process, right? But first is super easy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look, I'm just gonna settle my awareness to look into the field of our collective. And we're gonna look at all the knots of karma. We can look at all of them at the same time because consciousness is infinite and unbounded. So we, we could even look out and look at all the knots of karma in the whole creation at the same time. Well, that would be something. But let's just start with our collective. <laughs> we can start at least here. And anybody you love or any, anything that's really important to you. And we're going to look for first threads. And what I'm seeing is all the threads are anchored to infinity at their ends 
think of it like a necklace, right? There's like, there's the thread of the necklace, there's the knot of karma, <laughs> and then there's the clasp. And the clasp gives us infinity at both, it turns the, the necklace into a loop. So, first threads, initial, the initiation thread in the knots of karma. And what I'm feeling around these first threads is a little bit of a kind of rajasic energy and a tamasic energy. So there's a little bit of like agitation in them. They ha all seem to have some agitation in them. They also have this potential, potential to create some trouble. Potential to create some trouble. So the energy that creates trouble when we're talking about the relative level of creation, physical bodies and so forth, is that which breaks down. It breaks down the relative. And uh, one of the beautiful insights that was gifted me over the last couple of weeks since I last saw all you guys was that we know that the energy of creation responsible for the breaking down side of the divine dialogue is associated in Vedic terms with the god Shiva. Shiva is, brings everything back to silence. It, brings, it breaks down the relative and brings everything back to the field of pure knowledge. And um, the reason I found out recently, the reason that Shiva is given that responsibility is because Shiva is the most compassionate. It was a very sweet realization. Because the breaking down process is so tender and it's so, it can be so difficult that if it isn't performed with utmost compassion, then the suffering would be far worse than it actually is. And it doesn't matter if you want to give it a name. It doesn't matter. Maybe, you know, a Hindu name doesn't suit you or something. It's fine. Think of all these forms as forms of our consciousness everybody's consciousness. So compassion is inherent. Compassion and wisdom are inherent in the breaking down process. The problem, okay, I'm seeing where we need to focus our healing attention. The, the problem rises when you've got the breaking down process going on, but the, the concept or the the ability to perceive the compassion and the wisdom is dampened. And the ability to perceive the pain of the experience of the breaking down is dominating. And that is an imbalance. That is an imbalance. It is absolutely possible. It is absolutely possible to bring balance into this aspect of creation where the relative breaks down in such a way that awareness or senses of perception can fathom the wisdom and the compassion as a more dominant, as more of a dominating aspect of the experience than the discomfort. All right. Offering that concept into the source of creation. Holding silence. And so I'm again seeing those first threads with their kind of, uh, kind of aggravated energy in them. And so what's happening is in the first threads is bringing a lively awareness of compassion and wisdom. We could say that the causal body is humming or resonating with compassion and wisdom. So it's kind of setting like a foundational vibrational frequency for these first threads. But I'm very happy to share with you a realization about how the causal body does that, which just came up today. And it really is going to help tie this into our physiologies. Because as I said, I know we've got people here who are very uncomfortable tonight. So 
Um, so it happens that the physical body has energies, intelligences in it, responsible for the healing process, right? Sometimes I call them Davic energies, these forms of intelligence that heal, that knit bones back together and that reduce inflammation and so forth. However, there's an overarching intelligence for all that Davic energy. And the word that I used to describe it is body elemental. So we can think of it as like kind of a big Davic form that sits over top of all the little worker bees that are inside the body healing. And the body elemental also has a cord of light. But the body elemental is a very, very subtle aspect of our physiologies. So our bodies have a cord of light. And most people's cords of light are about that big. That's my perception. Of course, there are always variations and some people flute out and some are truncated and it's all different. But, but the body elemental has a cord of light. It's like, it's like a large form around us that's big. It's like a shaft. It's like a shaft of light. It's like a sacred space in which our bodies reside. And when the causal body, when the causal field produces a resonation of, in this case, compassion and wisdom, the instrument, the, the resonating space is this shaft of light. It is this co great cord. It's like a great cosmic cord because the body elemental that level of our physiology and that level of our body's intelligence is much older and it's much, it's much longer lasting. It's much, it's closer to eternity than the physical fleshy body. The body elemental has its own flow of evolution. And it's really very, very integrated with the physical body. So when compassion and wisdom are resonating in the shaft, which is this giant cord that's big like this, like of my body, right? Like this. It's like a big kind of around my body. Then this actually promotes a healing for the body elemental. And what I'm seeing for everybody, in our, all of us in our group, and many other people who aren't here um, in real time with us tonight, is that the dedication to the spiritual path and the time spent expanding consciousness and refining perception upgrades the physiology in such a way that the original body elementals that we were born with are not necessarily appropriate for our condition now. The body elemental also needs a sort of upgrade, a support and an upgrade. And so this work that's happening right now of the causal body producing this flow of compassion and wisdom, which then is going in and it's integrating mostly in the heart center area, um, is allowing for an increased ability to identify the compassion and the wisdom that's in any symptom or any difficult situation, number one, so that every time difficulties are arising or any time you feel pain, that what you're primarily focusing on is the compassion and wisdom that, that's behind that experience, but it's also healing the body elemental. It's upgrading the body elemental. And the reason this is so important is that any kind of illness or any kind of suffering that goes on in the physiology, it's essentially up to the body elemental to fix it. So we need to have like a nice relationship with our body elemental. It's very important. Generally, because that part of the consciousness is responsible for repairing and rejuvenating the body, the general relationship that we as individuals have with the body elemental is to be kind of demanding. That's most people. They're like, well, 
you know, I can, I can do this thing. I can do this sort of somewhat abusive thing to myself. And then I'm just going to have to get over it. You know, I'll just, I'll just get over it. I'm tough. You know, I have, my father used to have a saying that he had a cast iron stomach. So he would eat things and I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. He's like, Oh yeah, it doesn't bother me at all. I have a cast iron stomach. Anyway, he's not with us anymore. So, um, yeah. So that, that kind of attitude, it's a little bit like the attitude that people have when they go to doctors, right? Like there's something wrong with me. So I'm just going to let the authority take care of it. The thing is the relationship with the body elemental has to be a two-way relationship. We have to take care of our body elementals too. And the body elemental really needs um, a good, needs to be in touch. We need to be in touch the, the, the being then the physiology need to have a very copacetic relationship with that aspect of the physiology of the con field of consciousness, which is responsible for all the healing and not in a demanding way, but in a very, very reverent, humble and sweet way. And I think one of the reasons that the body elemental ends up in that position to us as humans is because by its nature, it is so humble. It is so reverent. It is so, it is such a servant, which will always do whatever the physiology needs at any time. So people just get used to it. So like a little bit like being enabled. People just get used to, you know, doing whatever themselves. I've got earrings on, they're pinching my ears, you know, but I'm like, well, you know, my ears just have to buck up. They, they just have to get along with that because, because we still have a few more minutes to go. <laughs> so... It is what it is. It looks good, you know. <laughs> anyway, it goes with the necklace. <laughs> anyway, but you get the idea. You get the idea that there's, we have to touch on that. So in that spot, what we can do is bring compassion and wisdom, right? And what the compassion and wisdom do is they support an integrated flow of healing energies to the areas that require that. And I know for some people, those areas are not just physical, but they, they're also like mental and emotional, and there's old stuff with ancestors and so forth. But I'm just feeling that opening, the integration of the relationship, and the acceptance and love, looks like what's happening is the superconscious, which is the part of the physiology responsible for self-love, self-acknowledgement, self-protection, and so forth. That part of the being is acting like a liaison between the physical body and the body elemental so that it can spread out its influence and support in both directions at the same time. That means any time the body elemental moves forward to support you and to activate the healing energies of the physiology, it also receives healing. This has not been the case previously. This has not been the case. It's been more of an exploitative relationship, but this is not the case anymore. The exploitation is leaving because the superconscious, and that's just, it's a random name. I never felt that it was the best name for that part of the consciousness, but it will do for now, um, but the, the part that's responsible for self-love, self-protection, et cetera, et cetera, that it's taking over the junction or the relationship between the physiology and the body elemental in order to naturally, the byproduct of that is the elimination of exploitative energies, the elimination of beliefs, which do not serve the healing process. The looks like cords are being also uh, dredged off the body. There are cords that are starting to disassemble from those knots of karma right now. And I'm seeing for a lot of people, it seems like it's also up and down the spine. Lots of cords of karma are being released off the spine. Very good nervous systems. Hmm skeletal systems, 
sometimes the reason we get sick is just because some area of the body needs extra attention. It's crying for attention. And by going there, what we do is we activate divinity in that spot. I think I've said that before, but it's good to be reminded. Good. So I love it that we've kind of gotten down to this point in the process where I'm seeing more of these threads unraveling from the knots of karma. We First, we integrated, right, with the first threads, we integrated this compassion and wisdom. And now that's supporting the ability for those first threads to settle down a little bit and to be less sort of agitated and aggravated. I'm just going to look again and offering back into the silence of being, the silence of being, it's a real self-referral loop right there, to address those first threads. Because if we can bring transcendental awareness or pure being into the first threads, obviously they're anchored to being at both ends, right? So the agitation is already settling down because of the compassion and wisdom. So leveraging that step, we can start to, I'm just focusing on how this deeper level of pure silence, wholeness, wholeness can go into those first threads. So what I'm noticing happening as the wholeness comes in, there's more of a releasing of discordant feelings. There's something about those discordant feelings at a very deep level of the physiology, uh, pain bodies. Pain bodies also form around them. So we could almost think of that as like another layer of the seed, right? In the very center of the seed, you've got these threads of karma. And then there's like a shell around that that's got a, a lot of discordant feelings. And then the shell around that. What did I just say? There was something. Pain bodies. Pain bodies. Thank you. Pain bodies. And pain bodies originate from the effect of that knot of karma looping up to the relative level of creation, then coming back down again. Awareness. Awareness loops up from that knot of karma and it has its expression at the surface. And then the person's like, I do not feel good. And then that I do not feel good comes back and it loops back into where the knot of karma is. Thank you for <laughs> um, Pain bodies make it easier to deal with pain. So the value is that they have this capacity to kind of enjoy the pain, sort of, to sort of feed off of it a little bit. But there are also attachments to the pain. So ultimately, in order to disassemble the knot of karma, it's necessary to also let go of the pain bodies, the attachments associated with the pain bodies. Because in the short run, the th and this is, this is a really important principle. In the, sh in the long run, we want to always be working in terms of long-term effects, if possible. Because if we're thinking only in terms of short-term effects, then um, actions could have negative karmic implications. But if the being is lined up with the cosmic goals, Right, cosmic intention, divine, the, the big goals like union with divinity, right? Divine union, that's like a big goal. Short-term goal is, I just want to get through the traffic right now because it's like everybody's in my way, <laughs> right? So short-term goals, long-term goals. So if we're aiming towards long-term goals, even in the relative, there are long-term goals, right? Then the actions taken will serve the creation from a broader perspective, a broader scope. The short-term goals are almost always more self-directed, um, you know, serving oneself in a more individual way. Mm, I'm feeling that also kind of that idea is doing something good for the ancestral lines. Good. So some, some nice downloads for the ancestors right now. And I'm also feeling a lot of energy moving. A lot of energy is moving now. I think that was an important point, I guess, <laughs> that just came up. 
that supported the way we deal with stress. And that ties us into karma. You know, we often look at planets. We look at the planets as reflections of our karma. And um, my dear friend, who knows a lot about planets, she was saying to me, the thing about the planets is they're essentially neutral. I mean, they're all beings and they're all, you know, great ancient spiritual forms in creation. But each one of us as individuals responds to each planet a little differently depending on their position um, at the moment of birth. And a, I would say a long-term goal of our healing collective and the war, energy work in general is to provide a model for all of us to deal with stress in an um, ever more effective manner. I mean, in the end, that's what it's really about. You know, we have, we have our beautiful dietary habits and exercise habits and rest habits, meditation, yoga, things that are good, you know, taking a walk in the sunshine. There are lots of good ways to deal with stress. But with energy healing, what we're doing is we want to go into the essentials of what are, for example, how do we restructure the belief system that's behind our gut reactions to stress? Because a lot of times the first initial reaction, excuse me, I'm going to cough in just a second. <coughs> All right. Our first gut reaction is, I know. Oh, I would love some. Thank you. You're the best. which may or may not come up, probably not till tomorrow, but uh, all week I was fighting a virus. And usually for this physiology, I can sit down in 10 minutes and just blow it out of my system. And I'm winning, <laughs> I'm winning the fight, but this one has been different. It's been more tenacious. And so I was looking at, well, why is that? And uh, the answer that came back was very interesting. You know, we were working with this dark energy that causes night terrors in children. Well, one of the ways, one of the um, angles of looking at that energy is to look at it in terms of it being kind of like a virus on this earth that seems to infected, have infected quite a large portion of our world. Maybe not, oh, thank you so much. Maybe not 100%. You're the best. Thank you. It matches my outfit and the background. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's affected a lot of people. And uh, when the idea that that, that's like a, a, a knot of collective karma, right? It's been sitting on Mother Earth and on humanity for like, really so long it's hard even sometimes to like measure exactly how long it's been when it came to my awareness that it was like a virus it was around in december and i've been sort of grappling with that energy ever since and when this virus came up and i've had to be excuse me very very careful about what i feed this body and what i do in order to keep it at bay I realized that this is the last dregs of it because when I was grappling with it before, it wasn't physical, but now it's finally come up to the physical material level and I'm looking at it and I realized that that's why this body is, it's almost like playing with the virus. It's like, I'm like really good one day and I wake up the next, next day. I think, I think it's almost gone. And then I just go a little bit off my mark and it, it winds its way back. It's like, no, I'm still here like that. So so slowing it down, slowing down the healing process provides the opportunity for an analytical mind to go in and to discriminate all the details of that, that feature. And so this thing I expect will be out of my completely 100% in a day or so, another two days, maybe something like that. But in the meantime, it's been revealing it's revealed to me the dynamics 
of how we interface and how I protect myself and how it likes to move in and how I have to protect myself to that. And I know I'm consciously aware that this is happening in order to get a handle up on that big old stress that sits on humanity once and for all, once and for all. We've done a lot of healing on it, but we need to do more. It's time to start looking at questions. We've got a lot of questions tonight. Can we demagnetize? Ooh, that's a nice question. So one the very brilliant question just came in. Can we demagnetize that first thread of karma? Because that's what it does. It gathers all those other threads around it. Absolutely. One of the ways of demagnetizing is to stabilize ourselves in a position where as soon as the thread comes in, our main focus, the primary focus is on the compassion and wisdom that's associated with the experience of that thread. Because it's an old, old, old habit. It goes back many generations, many. In fact, it's probably connected to the virus, which is probably no coincidence that I was just mentioning that. To blind, it's like a blind spot. The blind spot is on the compassion and wisdom. And then what that does is when the the experience, which is somewhat stressful, rises up. The first focus is on the pain of it and the suffering of it and the, the horror of it and the terribleness of it. Which, of course, just creates imbalance. So we don't need to go there. We don't need to go there. I mean, we don't want to be unrealistic either, right? If something needs to be addressed. But it needs to be addressed with compassion and wisdom first off. So we go right to the tools. Those are our tools, our first tools. The other tools that I was looking at as I was uh, exploring this topic over the last couple of weeks, of course, are Dharma. So it's in a way uh, timely that we did healings for Dharma at the previous webinar, because these tools of truth, right, which is wisdom, basically, compassion, which is, oh, compassion. So those are two of the legs of, these are the legs of Dharma, right? Wisdom, compassion, cleanliness, or purity, and austerity, or tapas. And tapas, tapas means basically letting go. I was actually reading a little bit more deeply about tapas in the last week. It means making a conscious choice to go without some comforts, making a conscious choice to go without some comforts for the sake of the blessing that that brings. Like having the cold. Like I'm, there are certain foods I'm not eating that I usually eat, that I'm not eating. My mom knows. I'm having chlorella tablets for lunch. Ooh, <laughs> yum. Chlorotops and water. <laughs> but anyway, you get the idea that that's a conscious choice. It's like, I'm bigger than the relative, and I am choosing to do this austerity. I'm not going to eat the food that everybody else is eating. I'm just going to eat this very, very simple broken cell wall chlorella, because I know that when that goes in this body, it's not going to feed the virus. The virus is going to go, ew, give me some sugar. And I'm going to be like, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're not invited. So, <laughs> so you understand. The point is that that tapas is there, which is essentially um, letting go of attachments, ah, which is related to the pain bodies, right? Because the principal characteristic of pain bodies is attachment. That's like their primary mm, thread that causes them to come around the seed of karma. So what demagnetizes that? This beautiful question brings up a point that I wanted to share with everyone. And that is that I mentioned earlier that the threads come from all over creation. Some of them might be ancient and some of them might be ancestral and others might be current and so forth. And at any moment, all of us are experiencing a different mix of influences from our past that's ever changed. It's like a morphing or evolving or 
organic. It's almost like or, an organic form that is constantly like massaging our energy field. And so, you know, some stress will come in from some distant time. And for a while it's moving through. It's like, oh, I don't feel quite right. I don't know why. And then, it's, and then it goes. And then something's behind it maybe that's softer like that. So as long as the threads are able to keep moving and as long as there's a certain amount of balance, we're okay. It's when things get stuck that there's a problem. So I'm looking at the stuck because I feel as if that's somehow related to the fact that a thread will get stuck. The first thread will get stuck. So it's agitated and it's uncomfortable, but it's also stuck. And I think it's the stuckedness of the thread that causes other threads that have resonations that are harmoniously um, consonant. I'm using a lot of musical terms. <laughs> it's what I'm used to. But if you understand what I'm saying, that the first thread will have a certain characteristics and that when something else comes along that has similar characteristics that kind of fits with it, that one will come in and get stuck with it. Yes? It's something like sending love to the thread and then it feels fulfilled and then it's fulfilled so then it doesn't really let it go and move on. I love that idea. The idea is, there, is it possible to send some love to the thread? Because it's a living form, because it's a living form, I think it's a very important point. One of the things that can cause a form like that to get stuck is that it feels isolated from totality. And if we address that first thread like it's an enemy of some kind, that just causes it to feel even more isolated. So, you know, definitely part of the process is to go in and integrate. And one part of the healing tonight was to bring transcendental being into the first threads because that idea that if we can bring wholeness back to the first thread. But I love your idea of also loving. Love and acceptance. Love and acceptance, yeah. Because ultimately, all the threads have a place in the universe. We can think of them as laws of nature. They all have something. They've got some way of expressing themselves in the creation, which is useful and aligned with cosmic intention, with divine embodiment. It's just that for some limited time, if it's sitting in the system and it's stuck, then it's not doing its job and it makes the thread is uncomfortable and we're uncomfortable and the whole thing isn't working nicely. So we want to give it our loving acceptance, but I think it could be useful also to help bring it, and that's the compassion, right? That's the compassion, but to also bring it the wisdom of its full potential. It's full potential as an expression of totality, as divine expression. I'm feeling this thread. I think it's one of my threads though. So no worries. <laughs> Something from the 1970s. <laughs> so, but it's also in the collective. It's also a thread in the collective. I think a lot of people when they're younger, innocently uh, don't use the best common sense and do things that maybe aren't the wisest thing or maybe they do something that serves them in a short term but doesn't serve them in in long terms you know in terms of like the long game so to say so what i'm seeing going into that thread is forgive, a lot of forgiveness and understanding. <laughs> and it looks as if this particular thread, um, it has connected with it certain actions that brought impurities into the body and did not honor the body in the highest and most dignified way. So, that, that principle right there is actually something that a lot of people are dealing with right now. It has to do with abuse and exploitation. That <clears throat> when there's abuse and exploitation, when a person's experiencing that on the surface in their relationships with others, it's because at some level it's also happening here. 
So the good news is, the bad news is that's a blow for the ego, the small ego. The good news is that that puts the control of the autonomy to deal with that in one's own camp. And the level of exploitation is related to the relationship of the individual with the physical body and with the body elemental. So we can say now there's three parts of this relationship. We have how do I treat my, what level of dignity, at what level of dignity do I handle this physiology? And there's a download in there for everybody. There's definitely this very, very exalted and holy uh, approach to the physiology. By far our pr most prized and irreplaceable pr possession, right? So what I'm seeing is some shifting going on right now to reconfigure the relationship with the physical body that brings that relationship up to a level where the physiology, the actual physical form is honored in the same exalted manner that the divine is honored. And for some people, what's clearing is a sense of hopelessness that I feel like I don't have the resources to treat my physiology with the dignity that it deserves. And I have too many old habits. So the hopelessness and the old habits, <clears throat> we have to deal with the habits. Habits, again, are connected to karmic. Let's see how that one goes down. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> Yeah, so habits are associated with karma because what karma does is it locks habits in place even when you know that a habit should not be there. Even when you know you should not be doing something. So we're looking at the threads and the habits, the karmic knots behind the habits. Nice, 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 nice. So what I'm seeing in these karmic threads are the first threads seem to have gathered around them threads of cultural conditioning. And some of these cultural conditionings, they go way, 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 way back in time to times in our world, not like hugely back, like not like, <clears throat> not like 30,000 years or 40,000 years, but easily 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years like that, even 10,000 years where um, it was, there are a lot of cultural uh, traditions which are not only exploitative, they are abusive. <laughs> so, so when it's knit into the cultural patterning, then it becomes very, very difficult to avoid. If you're born as a little child in a culture that sacrifices its own children, and like that has happened in the history of the world, then, you know, there's not much you can do about that. You just, it's like you just absorb it and accept it and figure well that's just the way it is and the the experience can be traumatic enough that it carries that it leaves it gets stuck leaves leftovers so we're clearing that clearing the leftovers the habit of leftovers <laughs> with compassion and wisdom and I'm seeing that clearing on many, many levels, many, many levels. The leftovers are like energetic toxin in the physiology, right? In the system. And so the dissolving energies are resonating in the shaft of the body elemental to support the dissolving of any materials that are damaging to the physiology. Any uh, energetic materials that act like toxins. It's another kind of thread. See, we're discovering them as we go. Like I'd, I had not really seen that as a thread before, but with you, with all of you, with all of us together, then it starts to, there's more light shining on the process. I appreciate it so much. Another question. Um, she's gone to a dentist. 
Most of the time she experiences a lot of pain. Finally, she had the thought that there may be some karma involved from something not nice uh, that she may have done in a past life like many lifetimes ago. And so I'm actually, <laughs> and someone just wrote, wow. <laughs> um, I'm looking at this and what I'm seeing is that the karma is connected to experiences of extreme pain in the teeth in the past. That I think there's a history and the body elemental remembers experiences of pain in the past. And it's, um, it's such a sensitive area. And this is the area where we first contact with experience of the world coming inside the body. So <clears throat> the first contact point in the physiology is where the old beliefs that have the habit of um, looking at experience as, oh no, looking at it in terms of its darkest, uh, its darkest potential, you could say, the dark potential. So lots of fear, I'm, ex I'm seeing lots of fear is releasing from the mouth right now. And habits, and the habits go back, yes, multiple lifetimes, but with the multiple, the lifetimes where there was pain in the teeth, the pain in the teeth was because there was this habit of looking at any experience, any new experience, oh, what new food am I gonna put in my mouth now, right? And looking at it as, in its darkest light, putting a dark spin on it, so to say. And there is a kind of um, self-ennobling energy with that. There's a bit of ego, small ego connected up with that. And the feeling of, well, you know, this is the, this is the practical way to look at life. This is the wise way to look at life. Something happens, it's snowing, oh no, snowing, oh. We won't be able to get our cars out, you know, I mean, just that it's because it's practical. It's practical and it's, it's a realistic way to look at things. But it doesn't, but it's blinded. It's blinded from the compassion and wisdom that goes with every life experience, particularly experiences which are, are causing the relative to transform to break down and go back to source. I'm also seeing everybody's receiving a download of light medicine specifically for the teeth and mouth um, to rebuild, to build up enamel, to build up, uh, to calcify any little tender spots or soft spots, to um, rebuild the uh, microbiome in the mouth so that it's a, it's optimally healthy for the gums. And they keep balance. You want that balance. The balance is struck between the practical point of view. Something's happening. It is potentially dangerous. And the compassion and wisdom that are necessarily intimately yoked to that experience. Awesome. That's awesome. I can use that. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being. <laughs> Thanks for creating. Okay. <clears throat> I have a lady with terrible pain in uh, hips and lower back. Can't sit comfortably. Uh, it influences her ability to have jobs. Um, she's had to take drugs for it for 30 years. Yeah, terrible. Um, It's become worse lately, and it's been causing insomnia and restless leg syndrome. So it's affecting nervous system. Um, let's see if nervous system, very uncomfortable all the time. So I'm looking into this physiology and seeing that the myelin sheaths the, the, the fat around the nerves 
almost non-existent in some places. I'm, I know this lady is like super careful with her body and she's been like a yoga teacher and, you know, really, really honors her body as a beautiful, amazing body. Um, but I'm wondering if you're getting enough omega-3, enough of the right kind of omega-3. Because I, what I found is I had some problems with that at one time and I found that omega-3 helped a lot and there were also some, um, there were some enzymes too that were very helpful. I think thiamine was one, but I'll look it up and email you. But, um, but energetically, energetically, we can produce, the body can produce, I mean, it is actually possible to produce all the nutrients that the body needs just from the prana in the air, right? Like there are people on earth who are breatharians, that's a thing. Um, so it would be good to upgrade all of our ability, everybody, everybody's ability to extract the specific nutrients that the body needs directly from the air, directly from prana, directly from consciousness itself. Like a light medicine, we can produce light medicines out of just consciousness alone. So there is a light medicine which has the signature of the precise combination of fatty acids, amino acids, it's an amino acid, right? That wasn't an enzyme, it was an amino acid. Amino acids and uh, fatty acids that the nervous system needs to build a nice, robust, opulent, thick coating of fat around all the nerve cells. As we get older and we go into more vata time of life, that becomes an issue for everybody. So that light medicine, that quality of consciousness has a very specific energy signature. Everyone's receiving that energy signature right now as a download. And I'm just describing it to you, right? Because I'm getting it too. And I, I love being the describer person. It's very interesting to me. I wasn't expecting this when I first looked at the energy signature, but it has baby energy in it. <laughs> you know how fat babies are? They have all those ripples and creases everywhere. Yeah, it's really exciting and beautiful to see babies all chubby like that. And so soft and supple, beautiful. So it's, a, it's an energy that's in abundance in the baby physiology. The body elemental knows all about that, right? Because the body elemental was with you when you were a baby. So the body elemental is well able, is well able to reproduce in that shaft of light, reproduce that baby fat, basically, but just around the nerves, just around the nerves, just in the spots that it's needed so that it's balanced, needs to come back to balance. I'm looking. There are a lot of like very young person qualities in it, like innocence. There's a, a quality like awe. You know that, that experience when every new experience is just breathtaking and amazing. <laughs> Even the simplest things, amazing. And we're being, this is interesting, in this light medicine that's coming into the body to, to replenish the fatty coatings around the nerves is also connected to the waters of the body. I'm realizing it um, based on <clears throat> a download that I recently got when we were driving over the Mississippi River. It was one of the most beautiful downloads I've gotten in a long time. And um, I realized the Mississippi River is the mother of America. Such a great, big, beautiful river. And that motherly love, 
that like um, you could call it an expression at the surface of creation of the ideal love of the mother of creation. So mother creation's like this perfect love, but gives this perfect love, but she's so, she's so intangible, right? But then she has this ability to bring her loving expression up to the surface. And anyway, that's where the baby gets its fat. It gets the fat from the mother because it's drinking milk, ideally, <laughs> unless it's on the bottle. But we want to hope that in the in its ideal form. And that's when I realized that that love is not just in the mother, the mother river of America, but it's in all the clouds and all the particles of water that are in the air. And there is no time at any time for any of us when we are not being nourished and fed by that loving energy. Yes. 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 And the question was, is it related to Ganga? Because that's why the mother Ganges is considered a mother like that. And the, the Mississippi is like that for America. Yeah, yeah. She's such a huge, great river. Just such a force. This is a Naga, some great Naga running through the middle of our country. Absolutely beautiful. All right, my beautiful ones. Speaking of beautiful, um, I see another question came in. And I, oh, saying, oh, saying thank you to the body elemental, deepest gratitude and love. So um, we're at our time already, but there are so many questions I didn't touch on today. So I really would like to connect uh, with other people's questions for tomorrow. Um, but thank you for everyone who sent in questions. I'm so grateful when you do that because I really enjoy crafting my presentation to accommodate everybody's needs. I feel like it makes it very more relevant and I, and I appreciate you all so, so much. It gives me a chance to give back to all of you a little bit more. So thank you for that. And thank you for being with me. Um, everybody will receive recordings of both today's session and tomorrow's session. And I can't wait to be with you all again tomorrow morning and um, go into an even deeper explanation and exploration of the dissolving of the cords or the seeds of karma. Uh, what do we call them? Un uprooting. Uprooting the seeds of karma. All right, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. And for those of you in Bali, have a lovely day. And I'll see you all again soon. Bye.